live at the moment. So we're into our second session. We're going to begin with the head of the Malaria Research Center at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Peter Agri, who he said stumbled into his Nobel Prize. Dr. Agri. Wow, TEDx. I've enjoyed it up to this moment, I have to tell you. <laughs> But Scott Simon, Sonia Son, I'm starstruck. So I'm a scientist, and I thought I would use my opportunity to share with you another side of science that's not often highlighted. The taxpayers of the United States have always been the most generous supporters of science on the planet. The science ongoing in American universities and, and institute labs is among the best science in, uh, ongoing in the planet. The individuals, the scientists working in these laboratories make breakthroughs and win big prizes, yet there's a disconnect. And the disconnect is that the public, who is a supporter, seems distant from science. And I think part of the problem is our own fault. As scientists, we don't take enough time to reach out to the public. I think also when children are in impressionable ages, there's way too much emphasis on being smart, which is something that they're born with, and not enough on being creative and curious, which is something we could cultivate. So I'd like to do a little demonstration. It may not work here because this is a pretty eclectic audience, but I'd like to sort of audience participation, rapid response. I'm going to ask a question and shout out the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, don't be shy. The word scientist is often expressed as a two-word phrase. Say it. Yeah. Oh, mad scientist. Okay, that's, that's the right answer. You, Okay, such an individual working in his castle made a, uh, a, a man out of human body parts. The name? Okay, very good in terms of Hollywood science and science fiction. How about the elements? Name the element from which the atomic bomb was first created. Uranium. Uranium. And the gaseous element from which the more powerful bombs are now made? Absolutely. How about names of scientists? Name a well-known theoretical physicist from the early 20th century. Einstein. Name a well-known life scientist who's still living. Peter well, Peter Agri doesn't know. It is. <laughs> That's called cheating. <laughs> I think the problem is that we have not taken part in the public debate, and a lot of people don't know who we are. So I'd like to change that a little bit, and I'll start by uh, sharing uh, a few stories. And let's start with the Nobel Prize. This is something that it's sort of awe-inspiring, but it gets in the way of reality. And I'll tell you a story that laureates like to tell, and this will tell you exactly how you win a Nobel Prize. Listen up. <laughs> so the Nobel laureate and his wife were on vacation, driving in the desert, running low on fuel. They stopped at a convenience store outside of the park. They were in Joshua Tree or Death Valley. The laureate, a rather serious fellow, filling the tank, his wife sitting demurely in the front seat, because as well known, most laureates are older white guys, pretty serious about themselves. And the wife looks through the windshield and sees an old hippie leaving the convenience store with a handmade earring and long gray stringy hair. And she recognizes him. She runs across the parking lot and throws her arms around him and starts kissing him and hugging him. And the hippie's kissing her and hugging her. And the laureate's pumping gas. <laughs> Darling, it's time to go drive off. He turns to her. What was that all about? And the wife now with tears in her eyes looks at him and says, Dear, I never told you this, but before I met you, I was in love with that man. And the laureate's irritated. He loses his temper and says, Well, it's a good thing you didn't. You'd be stuck here in the desert, and after all, I won the Nobel Prize. And she glares at him and says, No, you don't understand. If I'd married him, he would have won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> there's, There's... There's somebody here in the second row in a lavender colored sweater that loves that story. That's my wife, Mary. <laughs> so, if, come on, I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. <laughs> if you asked her, Mary, what would happen if you'd marry the hippie? She'd say, I did. <laughs> Those of us who have gone into science, I think, invariably have done so because of some inspiration, some individual. Now, when I left the room, I had a point here. Ah, this looks like it. Here was my inspiration. It was my dad. 
He was a son of Norwegian farmers from western Minnesota, earned a PhD in chemistry, became a college chemistry professor at St. Olaf. There is a college, not a town. <laughs> And he, he would bring my brothers and me to his laboratory. We would do simple experiments. They weren't experiments. He knew what he was doing. A drop of a colorless solution into another colorless solution turns bright pink. It's like magic. But in science, you understand the magic. The first solution is dilute hydrochloric acid. The second solution had an indicator dye. When protonated, it's colored. This was fascinating. So in third grade, when asked to draw pictures of our, our, our intended careers, I sat and carefully drew a picture of a chemist with test tubes because my dad was my hero. Although, and he was the chairman of the chemistry department, saying all, but sitting beside me, Jay Peterson, my dear friend, I noticed was drawing a picture of a burglar. And <laughs> I always wondered, did Jay become a, a lawyer? Or, or a, a congressman? Or a, 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 lo a lobbyist? No, no, he actually, he's a primate biologist at the University of Chicago. So I think having a scientific experience and an inspiration is really important. Now, Dad was one of these Teddy Roosevelt type exuberant individuals. As, as, an, as an adolescent, I, I lost a lot of this excitement about science. And in ninth grade, when I was told I had to perform an experiment or a demonstration for our, our science class, I was stuck. And like a lot of adolescent boys, I just stalled, procrastinated. So finally, the night before, it was, had to be a presentation or I'd get a failure. I asked Dad for a suggestion. He says, I have a great idea. You'll demonstrate the oxidative potentials of metals in water. I thought, what? <laughs> watch a nail rust? He said, no, no, watch this. And he brings home a, a shoebox with three test tubes and colorless solutions, each containing a sliver of metal. Now, you all know what this is, the periodic table. Upper left, hydrogen, whoop, wrong button. Okay, number, atomic number one, number one, helium, number two, number three, the pointer's a little dim. Number three is lithium, and that's the start of the alkali metals. And we all know that electrons love to live in pairs. Lithium has three electrons. Below that, sodium has, uh, I think, 11, and potassium, nine, 19, and we won't get into rubidium and cesium. So the object was to demonstrate oxidation. So I took this in front of my class, uh, dropped the sliver of lithium into a beaker of water, it fizzed. The lithium donated its electron, formed lithium hydroxide. It was kind of cool. The kids thought the, the little fizzing. The next, sodium, a bright yellow flare on the top of the surface. It didn't even sink into the water because it was oxidizing so vigorously. The third, potassium, a brilliant pink flare shot around violently. The kids loved it. And uh, at that point, I was stuck because I hadn't listened to how I was supposed to end the experiment, so I dumped it in the sink. <laughs> Kaboom! <laughs> a fireball shot to the ceiling. <laughs> the potassium had oxidized, hitting the water, igniting the hexane, the solution, which contained them. Anyway, they had to repaint the ceiling. My sweater that my mother had knitted me for Christmas had little brown dots. My eyebrows were burned off. But a scientist, I think, was in some way born. <laughs> so our family was important to my, my interest in science. And shown here, I am with my brother Jim. We got our Eagle Scouts. But part of growing up in a family, and we all grew up in families. Very rarely does some individual not have a family. Uh, this taught us a lot. So dad was a college professor. Mother was a farm girl from South Dakota who never was allowed to go to college. They didn't have the money, but she loved to read and read to us every night. And so we knew a lot from what mother read to us. But also as growing up in a family, you learn some other lessons. And one of them is that life is not fair. So Jim and I, and Mark, the little one in the red, red blazer, did well in school, became medical doctors. My little sister Ruth, shown here, was born with a defect that led her with a form of Tourette syndrome and severe emotional instability. She's never had a normal life. And Paul, shown in the sweater on the far left, was born learning disabled with motor disability. He's never been able to play baseball or ride a bike very well. He reads at the first grade level. And so growing up in this family, I don't think I was kinder than any other child, but I was aware that there are some things that we can't control, we don't understand, <clears throat> But possibly science or medicine would lead to new discoveries. 
So I'm skipping quickly through my life to get to the science here. Fortunately, uh, and I was not a good chemistry student in high school, I got a D, but I went to the little college dad taught at Minneapolis, Augsburg College, a working class college, and I turned, turned to the studies, to the idea that I wanted to do something interesting and important in life, and became interested with a few heroes. It's important to have heroes in life. And two of my heroes are shown here, Linus Pauling, a scientist who won two Nobel Prizes, the second one for science activism. He led the way to the nuclear protests that led to the Test Ban Treaty. The second was Albert Schweitzer, a renowned theologian and world-class musician who started a hospital in Africa. And I thought, well, if I could do something like these men did, I'd feel successful in life. And so I, I sought my fortune, fish, finishing college early, hitchhiked around the world, heading to Baltimore, but going west, which allowed me to spend months in the poorest places of Asia, seeing the ravages of which most humanity in those areas experienced with hopeless illness due to infectious diseases. And I ended up here in Baltimore. Now people ask me sometimes, why did you pick Johns Hopkins? The answer is, they picked me. What I discovered is our medical school class had lots of students from prestigious universities, East Coast, West Coast, but there were students from the heartlands. One from Mississippi, one from Oklahoma, one from Nebraska. I was the one from Minnesota or the Dakotas. I, I realized I was a diversity candidate, an affirmative action student. <laughs> it doesn't matter, it got me through the door. And the emphasis on learning at Hopkins was one thing, but we were always challenged to go beyond the textbooks, get into laboratories, and study what's really the limiting edge of knowledge. And I did so, I joined a wonderful laboratory in the Department of Pharmacology with the two most colorful individuals I could ever imagine, Pedro Cuatro Casas, a Spanish intellectual, and his good friend Gianfredo Puca, a film actor from Italy, a downhill ski racing champion, who decided he would do the most important scientific discovery any Italian could accomplish. He would solve the molecular basis of femininity. And he did. <laughs> First isolation of the estrogen receptor. These guys did it. Now, the rest of the lab, we, we were, we are not as photogenic as Pedro and Gianfredo. <laughs> and, and in fact, you could probably mistake us as sort of a, a, a branch of the, gang, of the Manson gang or something. <laughs> but they were from very interesting people in the lab and became lifelong friends because science brings people from different cultures together. A Spanish anarchist, a Polish eccentric snake collector, a big wave surfer from Hawaii. These are the young people in the lab. And one summer, an intense Palestinian from American University of Beirut joined us, Naji Sehun, and I became his friend, and he confided he hated Israel. He assumed all American Jews were Zionists. And he worked alongside Marvin Siegel, the son of an Orthodox rabbi from Brooklyn, New York, and they became the best of friends. It's amazing. Now, I didn't have a lot of social sophistication, and I was working on the infectious causes of diarrheal disease. And I was uh, at a mixer at Goucher College, a wonderful institution, chatting with a very attractive young lady who asked me, Peter, what kind of medical doctor do you think you'll be? What's your specialty? <laughs> you know, I, I think she was hoping I would say neurosurgery or radiology, but I told her the truth. I said, I'm interested in diarrhea. <laughs> that, that was the end of that. But I then subsequently met Mary, grew up on a farm in, outside of Ellicott City, Maryland, before Columbia. We fell in love and we got married, and we've been together ever since. And I think the illustration is that scientists have, they have loves, they have anxieties, and they often will have families, and this is often the driving force for everything. So this cute little boy here has recently graduated from the Maryland Institute College of Art. So he, there you go. He's, he's a sculptor. He's doing his dream. And, and the, the message here is that the lifestyle, the work, family balance is sometimes difficult, but in science it's often the same life. So we took our kids camping, we're very blessed, we have four wonderful kids, and we, on a scientist's salary, of course, we knew every year our vacation would be in a tent. <laughs> so we went to all the great national parks, and we said, next year you get to pick the national park, and they all said, Disney World. <laughs> Not a national park. But we went to the Everglades, we went to Disney World, and on the way back, we stopped in Chapel Hill because I was stuck in the laboratory, a new protein. We didn't know what it did. And I talked to a friend, John Parker, who very patiently listened to me. He was a great physiologist. He said, Peter, I think this new protein, it's in red cells and renal tubules. This may be the long-sought water channel. 
Water channels allow water to move through our tissues very, very ordered way. Now, of course, water has great, great beauty and great damage, and great, great, great uh, uh, potential for damage if it's in disequilibrium. A tranquil river, when it faces a break, that's my wake-up call. But there's a big clock here. It can't be right. I only have three minutes left. <laughs> okay. In our bodies, water moves through special channels, but no one had ever been able to identify them. This process of osmosis that we all learned about in school when we were small children must re require some cellular equivalent to a plumbing system, but no one had identified it. And we did really by serendip identify it. And the experiment shown here demonstrates our first experiment. So these are two eggs from frogs. Frog oocytes a millimeter in diameter. The one on the top left is a control. The one on the top right is injected with RNA encoding this new protein. Now the culture media is isotonic. It's, there's a saline at the same concentration of the inside of the cell. If these are transferred to distilled water, the one expressing a water channel should now be osmotically active, and it, did, it exploded. We knew in the first experiment that we had it. <laughs> and, and, and this, by the way, Greg Preston, the postdoc, this picture I took of Greg was actually three years after the discovery. He was still celebrating. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, every time I practice this, it came out to a different amount of time. So <laughs> I'm just going to skip through and show you a few slides of what's come from this. There are multiple different water channels in different parts of our body. In kidneys, they're involved. And, and each of this is a story with a young scientist. I'll just show their pictures because I don't have time to tell you about too many of them. This is what causes us to release dilute urine when we're overhydrated. And this can be significant. I saw the lines at the bathrooms. <laughs> or dehydrated if we're underhydrated. And of course, defects in this, this lead to clinical disease. And this was worked out. This is Landon King at Johns Hopkins. He started his scientific career as the quarterback of the Wake Forest football team. Very interesting fellow. Other members of the, family, of the team identified other family members. The aquaporins are involved in cataracts. This is Masato Yasui from Tokyo. In brain, Ulla Petter from Oslo. And here's in the next one, John Neely. John Neely is a farm boy from southern Kentucky, rejected when he applied to med school because he'd come from from a Bible college, not a prestigious university, but he stayed with it. He's now a Johns Hopkins neurologist. And he discovered the basis of brain edema, which leads to irreversible brain damage. I'm in my last seconds here. I'll tell you just about one other member of the family, the aquaglycerporins. They're involved in skin. The skin creams contain glycerol. Now, some executives from Christian Dior came to visit me, and I was really suspicious. What do I know that they'd like to know? And of course, they have a commercial product, and I'm not selling it. I have no financial ties to Christian Dior. I would love to have financial ties, but none are. <laughs> and so they have some natural product, which they can sell. You could buy this hydroxyl cream. It's about $50 for two ounces. And I guess the implication is if you use enough, you look like the model. <laughs> if you read the small print, it's in French. It talks about uh, spectacular results and aquaporin technology. And what's this Nobel Prize in chemistry? I showed this to my mother. She said, Peter, you're finally doing something useful. <laughs> with, with that, anyway, I hope I've put this Nobel Prize business in a little perspective and communicated to you that, in fact, science is done by individuals like ourselves. This is not a selfless devotion of hardship. It's an exciting adventure. And when you see things in the newspaper about a breakthrough in science from the University of Maryland or from Johns Hopkins, I'd just like you to remember that these are young scientists from all around the world pursuing their adventure and having a great time. Thank you.